Good morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season three and episode number 331 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryo Media Network. Yeah! Today, recording day is Monday, March 11th, 2024, and I have no idea what kind of day it's going to be with the Beaver Lodge because I got a bit of a late start this morning. Daylight savings time really screwed up with this beaver. Um, so I'm a little late starting. Thank you for your patience. I'm your host, the Eager Beaver, pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver A, and with me as always is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. We have a Monday morning little bite for you, but before we do anything more, let's ask Mr. Grizzly how your mental health is doing today, sir, and Kit Cassie has already appropriately noted that you have the pup background. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, I do. Um... I'm very tired because the time change messes me up. Because, I mean, technically it's 6.15 right now, not 7.15. So, you know, that throws you for a loop to begin with. Uh, so, number one, that that's the first thing. The second thing is I just, you know, I'm trying to get used to the upside-down life that I now have with this 80-pound dog living with me. <laughs> I love it. Don't get me wrong. I absolutely love it. But, wow, it's a fair chunk of work, you know. I'm, I'm okay with it. But, wow, it's, just, you know, yeah. I'm old, so it takes a lot out of me. <laughs> uh, and of course, the eighty-pound dog believes she's a lap dog. So, yes, yeah, yeah. she doesn't believe in personal space at all. <laughs> like not at all. Like, I mean, like there's no personal space with her. There just isn't. Like as evidenced by this photo. Let me show you this quickly. This was yesterday. Uh, oops, wrong button. Let me turn it on here. This was yesterday. And just, 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 uh, you know, just, uh, nope, personal space is not a thing. <laughs> <laughs> she just uh, sits down and crushes up against me. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's Lola. Uh, <laughs> mm. uh, How are you feeling? Um, emotionally pretty good, but physically, um, um, still actually better, much, much, much better. Okay. Not a hundred percent, but I'm, I'm just really tired right now, physically tired. So, you know. Um, I'll be back in the office tomorrow. So that's a good thing, you know? Yeah. yeah I empathize, my friend. I empathize. Mm. Uh, I, I, I'm doing well. I, like I said, I'm, I'm a bit tired too, but I think it's just because um, there's a lot going on yeah. <laughs> more than anything else. So um, yeah, I was uh, up early um, yesterday morning for a 9 a.m. curling match because I had to reschedule my Wednesday matches because, well, I was supposed to be on stage. And if I'm not on stage, I'm in rehearsal. So that's all changed, um, right? Yeah. And uh, we're opening in 17 days on uh, iPad to pull out of As You Like It, as most kids will know. But uh, in terms of acting, to focus on the production and marketing duties after missing two weeks, uh, being ill, 
was deemed that I was not going to be able to catch up uh, before we will rock you. I caught up beautifully. In fact, the director made a personal comment to me over the course of the weekend. Oh, that's good. Congratulating me on uh, being able to catch up so quickly. Um, but uh, yeah, so we were uh, playing on the ice at nine uh, and then we were done at 1045 and then I went to the curl, uh, to the rehearsal for noon and then we were there until four. So, <laughs> well, maybe like quarter to four. So yeah, by the time I got home at four, four fifteen, it was like, Alex is like looking at me and said, Hey, want to do something? And it's like, dude, <laughs> I am so exhausted <laughs> right now. <laughs> I wanted to go to bed and it wasn't even five o'clock. <laughs> Want to go for a walk? It's like I just spent four hours dancing and singing and jumping around all over the place. Trust me, I got my exercise. Thank you. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, but hey, I'm with you. And then last night, I, uh, of course, I was uh, watching the Briar final, mm -hmm. which was. Uh, um, how would I put it? I don't want to say it was a bad final because it wasn't a bad final, but it it, it was decided pretty early. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, as great as uh, McEwen was playing, Mike McEwen was playing, and he was playing great. He was the Brad Gushu even said that he was the best player throughout the entire tour, throughout the entire bond spiel, and he, objectively he was. Um, he he really was. He he was curling lights out. Um, but uh, you know. Brad Gushu's not a um, wasn't a going into it a five time Canadian champion mm. for uh, no reason, and uh, he tied the record for six, so uh, six times ca Canadian championship. He'll be going to the to the World Championships. Who uh, I can't remember off the top of my head where they are for the men, uh, but I'm sure Kit Michael, who is here, will be able to pop it up in uh, the chat. But it was a, a great tournament for both of them. And it was a great tournament for Canada overall because a lot of people that keep on asking, you know, oh, whoa, well, you know, why do we have the territories in there? And, you know, why do we even bother with the Atlantic provinces? You know, they never win. Well, PEI almost made it to the final six. They had a record of five and three, like the team that made it. It was just the head to head that decided who went to the playoffs. And uh, Northwest Territories did make the playoffs this year well, with Jamie Cooey. So, and um, Team Nova Scotia did very well as well. And Team Northern Ontario did very well. So, you know, curling is an any given Sunday sport. Indeed. It gets on a roll. And that's why we have them because, you know, everybody gets a shot. And every now and then people will surprise you. What is it you hear the sports commentators or commenters always say? They came to play. Yeah. That, that's the whole point of the game is to play it. <laughs> yeah, but like they gave 150%. Mm, I think objectively you can only give 100%. <laughs> yeah. The the team from PEI really came to play. I think the Skip his last name is Smith, his first name escapes me at the moment. But in all the times he had been at the Briar before had won a total of 4 games. Mm. Total. He won 5 this Briar alone. So he really wanted to win. Like he just, yeah, <laughs> he, he was very focused. Now, part of me is a little, I really would have loved to have seen PEI in the final six because that's a pretty rare occurrence. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but yeah, Brad Gushu and, uh, EG Harden and, uh, Mike, uh, Nichols and Jeff Walker, I believe are the four members, uh, core members of the team. And, uh, yeah. Congratulations, uh, winning six Briars. Uh, well, like I said, it's only been done a couple of times before, and never seven for the for the men. And same thing with the women. At, at six is the is the record as well. And there's a couple of people that share it. So uh, it's a feat. It's hard to do. So uh, good luck uh, to both uh, the women and the men. I believe the women start in Sydney, Nova Scotia. Uh, this coming weekend uh, for the World Championships, and uh, like I said, uh, Rachel Homan uh, went a had a perfect briar, lost no games at all throughout the oh, entire wow. thing, and not briar, sorry, Scotties. Uh, Gushu ha had lost two matches in the round robin, and then uh, went all the way through after that in the playoffs to to win uh, the tankard. So, 
It was some pretty good curling, however, uh, kits and cubs, some really good curling. Uh, and I would uh, pay attention to the world championships this year because uh, both those teams seem to be rather on fire. So um, that looks, uh, looks like there's some good stuff going on there. And um, while that was going on, since we're talking about curling, and I can uh, put it up there, um, there was also the World Wheelchair Curling Championships going on at the same time, which unfortunately doesn't get as much TV coverage as do the buyers. But uh, Team Canada did very well there as well, uh, bringing home the silver medal from the World Wheelchair Curling Championships. So uh, John Thurston, Ina Forrest, Gil Dash, Mark Ardison, and Chrissy Molnar uh, got together and uh, they lost to Norway in the final. But uh, a great performance from Team Canada there. Uh, unfortunately, the men and the women were shut out from the Junior World Championships, shut out from the podium, um, but still competed uh, valiantly. And uh, we give congratulations to all our curlers. It's uh, end of season all over the place and lots of World Championships going on at the moment. All right. News. <laughs> where does one begin um there's a lot uh, i don't know if a lot in some ways happened to canadian stuff it, it's been calm ish <laughs> yeah. um other than which, Skippy's rally this weekend which was more drivel senseless yeah. drivel and yeah his his speech he left out the powerful paycheck in the hand this time but he, he regurgitated the speech he delivered what at the pc convention i think it was in yeah City. a young couple sitting on a porch soaking in the warm evening air with a canadian flag gently hanging from the front of their brand new home yes with a Come cold on. drink in one hand and a powerful well paycheck implied in to be hand. powerful paycheck in the other saying we're home he longs for a time that never was. <laughs> yeah, I guess he got a lot of flack about the paycheck in one hand. It was like, who does that? It was like, well, well, everything's yeah. direct deposited well, now. We <laughs> picked him apart for that one. Paycheck in it. Who the hell gets a paycheck? So he is paying attention. Well, yeah. He's just doing this. So he just did the stupid stuff. Well, he just did the propaganda stuff. Mm -hmm. All right, but he removed the stupid. He removed, I can't even say he removed the stupid elements. He just removed the stupider elements. Stupider. <laughs> yes, the stupider element. A powerful paycheck in one hand. Who the hell is paid with an actual check today? There are some small businesses, I'm sure, that do it. No question. <sighs> but you know what? When I worked for a small company, they didn't give us a paper check. They literally deposited the money directly into our accounts. Every Friday, we got paid every Friday. And uh, they just said, open an account with Scotiabank, which is what we did. And they went and deposited the money directly into our accounts because they just said it was easier to do it that way. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that works. Yeah. Uh, and this was a company that had like 15 people in it and they paid us direct deposit. And that is going back to 2000. No, what am I saying? My goodness, 97, 97. Hmm. Hmm. There we go. Uh, the kits did come up in the, in, in the chat there. The men's world championships will be in Schaffhausen, Switzerland. Okay. There we I'm go. Sure I've the never ever heard where Schaffhausen is. I've heard of it. I just don't know what part of the country it's in. Hmm. Well, well there we go. Hey, you get to travel. Yay. Mm. <laughs> the Swiss teams are pretty good for the men and women as well. So mm. um, this, yeah. All right. Uh, yes. Yeah, so PP had a rally and whatever usual stuff happened um but i would uh because i talked about it on friday um i'd like to go south of the border because uh, last week uh, u.s president joe biden delivered the state of the union and uh i mean you'd have to be living under a rock to not know that the main narrative going on in the United States with regard to Joe Biden is that, well, he's old. Well, he's old. He, he can't possibly run anymore. You know, like, listen, let's, the, the other thing is, I, of course, as we know, Joe Biden has a long history of making some verbal gaffes. Mm. 
now and then. That's not a secret. So, you know, there have been times where, for example, he's mentioned the wrong country or like the wrong prime minister was something, you know, and then they, they seize upon that mistakes that all of us make. Right. I mean, the number of times the, the other day I was rewatching a thing, a thing of the show where I said I had to go curl at 7 a.m. And it was like, and you were looking at me like seven. It's mm. like, sorry, I mean, nine it was yeah. last Monday, one week ago <laughs> we all today, simple like this, we all. We all have moments where our brain goes faster than our mouth or our mouth goes faster than our brain. So, but because he's the age that he's at now, every single moment like that gets pointed at, pointed to and goes, ah, see, 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 he's, he's like yeah. mentally deficient. He's slipping into dementia. Meanwhile, <laughs> Donald Trump, um, you know, who's apparently not old. No, no. And apparently not slipping into dementia and apparently has his full mind. Because, you know, of course, we must look at the way we talk about politics Politics these days is that every person and every single thing that they've ever done happens and exists merely in a vacuum, disassociated from history and everything that they've ever done before or any contrast or comparison with someone else. Mm. It's like, you flubbed that one line, you're losing your mind. Uh, everybody flubs a line now and then. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> It's like rents, Skippy, rents have doubled under Trudeau. Well, rents more than doubled under Harper. Ah, this thing has happened. Oh, this thing happens all alone. And you no, know, you can't, you can't compare it to anything. And yet we do, we just start history when we start it. And like this, when we can't talk about any root causes or no, nope, that's just it. So, right. I had this other conversation online with somebody saying, yeah, you know, what, uh, was been saying about the military, right? That the conservatives are, conservatives cut and the liberals actually spend. And, you know, they're talking about how Prime Minister Trudeau has spent more on the military than as Harper. You know, Prime Minister Trudeau has actually increased spending for the military every year, except for when he's been in power. Whereas Stephen Harper cut it pretty much every year he was in power. And then someone comes and goes, and goes, "Well, what does Trudeau have to show for it?" It's like. Because we have a history of ordering planes and ships and whatnot and them arriving in two to three years, right? Yeah. In this country? It, it takes time. In this country, the prime minister of the day has the military the previous prime ministers left him, that are the legacy of the previous prime ministers. Anything that Trudeau has done, especially with major equipment, is going to be to the benefit of the next <laughs> prime ministers not the current one so you know i'm sitting there and i'm going like i'm being you know this is clearly a disingenuous question and i'm being set up by someone who just literally wants to say blame trudeau and of course when you make the point then they turn around ah oh, no 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 buddy you only get three or four years with that like this after that you have to like blame the prior current prime minister yeah you know for stuff like for example you know did you get the subway started to be built or you know did you make a deal with the provinces on a healthcare transfer or something like that? But when you're talking about buying high piece, you know, high, piece, high tech, you know, high caliber pieces of military equipment, usually in coordination with other nations and military contracts and whatnot, it's like, yeah, you know, whereas, you know, we talked about the other stuff where the military on like smaller stuff has a, you know, turnover time for procurement that's pretty good that we've mentioned on the show before. When it comes to the big ticket items, it's like never in my lifetime. Like we even had the Army Chris the other day that says like mm -hmm. a pure, pure, military pure, pure procurements of big ticket items at least eight years. Oh, easy. Minimum. Yeah. yeah. Minimum. Right. So I'm sitting there like this. Yeah. I, I see you coming, buddy. When you're asking me, yeah, he's been, you yeah, what is he? I believe he spent more money because he spends more money on everything. Well, yeah, population growth, inflation, and interest alone will ensure that it's going to happen. Yeah. We're going to pay more for absolutely everything in every department, especially eight years after the previous government. We got eight years of inflation, eight years of, you know. So, I mean, even if inflation was just at the target to 2%. For those eight years, we'd still be paying more, especially with population growth. So, um, yeah, very disingenuous discussions. These are the types of things. Again, you know, online media literacy is what we're doing here. If somebody turns around and asks you military-wise, well, what does he have to show for all the money? You're being set up for disingenuous 
conversation where the person is going to say stuff that's completely, well, is not going to be reality based. Right. That's so, it's like, you know, I disagree. Well, of course you disagree. That's the whole reason you asked me in the first place. What does he have to show for it? Because you know that the answer to the question when you ask me is nothing because it's not delivered yet. Ta da. So, yeah. It's just really. They got, they've got one playbook. They've got one playbook. Everything's mm -hmm. broken and it's all Trudeau's fault. And whatever conversation that you get into them, it's all geared and steered that way so that they can get to that conclusion and go, nah, uh blame Trudeau's fault. Ha ha. And then yeah. walk away. They've always got to blame Trudeau no matter what. Just, yeah. just, you know, it's his fault for everything bad that happens in this world. If it's something good that happens, it was the market. Yeah. But if it's something bad, it was him. Yep. That's pretty much it. Yeah. This is you know, from Mohan. I mean, prices go up, not down. How long have you been in government again, Pierre Polyev? Yeah. So, uh, have you got uh, the the State of the Union leak, uh, Mister Risley? Yeah, I just okay. have to. I just need so, time. I've sent you a, a first timestamp. Uh, I'm going to go through some uh, some elements of it. Um, Can let's we just run put this? it this way. Pardon? Can we run this? Yeah. 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 State of the Union. Yeah, you can run that. Okay. Um. So, um, here's the thing, right? They're saying he's old. They're saying he's fragile, and everybody was making a big deal. You know, this is like a do or die. Joe Biden must absolutely deliver this time around, or else, you know, if he does the regular old Joe stuff like this, he's dead. He's done. Everything they said about him is true, and we can discount him. And blah 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 blah. Well, uh, if you had been anywhere on social media or hearing anywhere of the critique, um, he delivered a barn burner, an utter and total barn burner of State of the Union. Um, he was on point. He was sharp. Uh, he got heckled so many times, so many times that even the uh, you know, Republicans were told. Enough. Actually, Mike, John Mike Johnson, the, who's the speaker, mm -hmm. told his party, please keep the heckling down before it started because it doesn't make us look good yeah and then of course you know marjorie taylor green showed up like she was going to some type of football game <laughs> with a maga hat on uh which is i don't understand how that doesn't yeah. yeah i don't know how that breaks any decorum rules because i like i think in canada you're not supposed to be wearing stuff that has political statements Correct. i believe when you're how some mps do it anyway however for stunts um but i don't know what the rules are in the united states uh no idea no idea nor do i care I yeah shit. really yeah don't care anyway uh and then there were other people who made a whole bunch of comments and heckled and uh he handled them oh boy did he handle them and the whole reason why mike johnson told him is because he knows that joe biden is quick on his feet and while they're all saying that he's slow and losing it they all know that he's quick on his feet and he knows how to deal with this and he says when you guys do that you give him an opportunity to respond which makes him look like he's there and he's with it mm -hmm. and that he's sharp stop giving those so it wasn't because he wanted decorum it's not because he didn't want the pre the, pre the president to be heckled it's because he knows that it always works out terribly for the republicans because it gives the president an opportunity to not look like he's falling apart so um and he didn't want to hand him that opportunity um so i've got just various little moments uh clips from it uh where he's just like nailing stuff home and all the time the only time i'm the entire time i'm watching this i'm thinking to myself i know this is canada and i know that our, our politics are you know the conservatives are trying to americanize our politics but in one way i think our prime minister could probably benefit from a once a year where he goes to the mic and <laughs> gives a state of something address because oh, we saw that interview speech. with Jess Jesperson. Mm -hmm. Ryan right? Jesperson. Well, well, that's the thing, the throne speech, but it's not read by the prime minister. True. Right? It's read so, by the governor general or the or, or the monarch if they happen to be in country mm -hmm. when it happens. Um and, uh, you know, we've been seeing things recently like, you know, Daniel Smith taking her eight minutes or taking a time and doing her address to the province and whatnot. And Blaine Higgs just did it as well. Um, and the prime minister is good in these moments. And there might be something to this. 
because it's an event. The State of the Union is an event in the United States. You know, everybody tunes in. You know, mm -hmm. there's some people that tune into politics only once or twice a year, and it's the State of the Union addresses. That tends to be a big one, right? That's, that's it. So um, let's talk about some stuff over here. Let's start with this first clip that I have here. Um, not can't actually read my notes at the moment. But. Well, that's not good. I'll just play there we the go. clip. Oh, where's the sound? Watching. Just like history watched three years ago on January 6th. When insurrection stormed this very capital and placed the dagger to the throat of American democracy. Many of you are here on that darkest of days. We all saw with our own eyes the insurrectionists were not patriots. They'd come to stop the peaceful transfer of power, to overturn the will of the people. January 6th lies about the 2020 election and the plots to steal the election posed a great, gravest threat to U.S. democracy since the Civil War. But they failed. America stood. America stood strong and democracy prevailed. We must be honest. Whoops. <laughs> Press Oops. the wrong button. <laughs> <laughs> it happened. All right. Well, there was more to that clip, but I'm not sure if we could find uh, find exactly where we were there. Um, but that was his first pretty much opening salvo. And as you saw behind him, uh, Mike Johnson didn't seem to be too pleased with the fact that they had failed. Mm. Here, I have some more of the clip. I just queued it back up. Okay. Thank you. My predecessor came to office determined to see Roe v. Wade overturned. He's the reason it was overturned, and he brags about it. Look at the chaos that has resulted. Joining us tonight is Kate Cox, the wife and mother from Dallas. She's become pregnant again and had a fetus of a fatal condition. Her doctor told Kate that her own life and her ability to have future in the field, children in the future were at risk if she didn't act. Because Texas law banned her ability to act, Kate and her husband had to leave the state to get what she needed. What her family got through should have never happened as well, but it's happening to too many others. There are state laws banning the freedom to choose, criminalizing doctors, forcing survivors of rape and incest to leave their states to get the treatment they need. Many of you in this chamber and my predecessor are promising to pass a national ban on reproductive freedom. My God, what freedom else would you take away? Look. He came out punching. So first one, January 6th, second one, abortion. Boom, boom. Mm -hmm. Those were in the first few minutes of the State of the Union Address. And yes, what other rights would they take away? Yeah. Right. Then uh, he kept that. I think you can keep on going from there, Grizzly, to 102, where he's talking about uh, America's comeback. 102? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. No problem. Hang on. Sorry. I was confused. The following. And with all due respect, Justices. Women are not without electoral, electoral power. Uh, excuse me, electoral or political power. You're about to realize just how much you get right about that. That was still on abortion. Mm -hmm. Clearly. Clearly. Those bragging about overturning Roe v. Wade have no clue about the power of women. But they found out when reproductive freedom was on the ballot, we won in 2022 and 2020, and we'll win again in 2024. <laughs> if you, if you, the American people, Send me a Congress that supports the right to choose. I promise you, 
I'll restore Roe v. Wade as the law of the land again. <clears throat> Folks, America cannot go back. I'm here to, tonight to show what I believe is the way forward, because I know how far we come. Four years ago next week, before I came to office, the country was hit by the worst pandemic and the worst economic crisis in a century. Remember the fear? Record losses? Remember the spikes in crime and the murder rate? Raging virus that took more than one million American lives of loved ones, millions left behind? A mental health crisis of isolation and loneliness. A president, my predecessor, failed the most basic presidential duty that he owes to American people, the duty to care. I think that's unforgivable. I came to office determined to get us through one of the toughest periods in the nation's history. We have. It doesn't make new, but in a news in a thousand cities and towns, the American people are writing the greatest comeback story never told. <laughs> so let's tell the story here. Tell it here and now. America's comeback is building the future of American possibilities, building an economy from the middle out and the bottom up, not the top down, investing in all America, in all Americans, to make every sure everyone has a fair shot, and we leave no one, no one behind. The pandemic no longer controls controls our lives. The vaccine that saved us from COVID are now being used to beat cancer, turning setback into comeback. That's what America does. That's what America does. <clears throat> Folks. Well, I think he kind of hit the nail on the head. Shots fired, eh? Mm -hmm. So uh, on the abortion issue, Roe v. Wade took it to task uh, for the people who are listening at home. Uh, the nine justices of the Supreme Court were there and in attendance. And uh, he basically admonished them. Mm -hmm. To their faces. To their faces. He says, you really underestimated women. And well, the truth is... Her food dish. <laughs> yes. And the truth is, is it's the proof is in the pudding, right? 15 ballot measures in the United States with regard to abortion mm -hmm. and the Republicans lost every single one of them. And then well, he talks about the, the comeback post COVID as well. Even, even women I know, there, there are women that I know that uh, you, you, when you say you're pro-choice, people automatically assume you're pro-abortion and that is not the case. No. It's not the case. It means you don't think you should be making the choice for someone else. It's somebody's choice to make. Yes. And that, are, that's what it boils down to. So I know lots of women who are, are, are not pro-abortion, but they are pro-choice. And I think a vast majority of American women are the same way. Even the ones who don't like the idea of abortion also don't like the idea of the government telling you, even though your, your, your fetus cannot be carried to term and it runs a risk to you as the mother, your life, and maybe you already have children, I don't know, or like in the case of this particular woman, uh, if she carries it to term, she may not. She may not survive, and if she does, she probably can never have children again. And the child cannot be born alive. It, it will be stillbirth. They call it. Yeah. So she had to leave the state because the state of Texas wouldn't allow her to abort a non-viable fetus. Do you see the problem with that? Because I do, and I think a lot of women. Again, the same women who are not you know, who are dead set against abortion will look at that and go, hang on a second here. That's going, that's a, that's too far. You're, you're, you're putting my life at risk. And what if I already have two or three children? What if I want to have children in the future? You're putting my life at risk to prove a point that you have control and domain and dominion over my body because that's what it boils down to. Yep. Pretty much. And on that issue, uh, as we mentioned on the show last week, France. Yes is considering passing uh, a motion, or not a motion, but uh, it's in their, I guess it's in an amendment to the Constitution that would protect the women's right to an abortion. And that did happen last, uh, that did happen on International mm -hmm. Women's Day. Yeah, that's specifically. right. 
became the first country in the world to guarantee the right to abortion in its constitution. President Emmanuel Macron had promised he, quote, would not rest until women across Europe have the same protection. Yeah, so they're pushing back. Like I said, 2024 is the year of the pushback. And it's not going to be just from grassroots folks like ourselves or small media organizations like us. It's going to be from the people and the, and the progressive leaders around the world who are saying, okay, enough of this shit. We have come too far to go backwards. We're right. not going back. We're going forward. Yep. Now, as you heard in that clip, there was, that was the first instance of heckler where somebody, when he you know, talked about Roe versus Wade and, and the COVID and the comeback and everything, where somebody goes, you lie. And he just let it go by. He won't let all of them go by. Um, the next clip is with regard to the in infrastructure bill. And uh, I kept it a little bit because he actually mentioned um, indigenous mm -hmm. uh, people. And um, I thought it was really, really, really interesting. Um, Aldo, I th think I may have given you the wrong cue. The wrong cue. Yep. Yeah, sorry. Hold on. <laughs> yeah, I've just looked at my notes and it's like, no, what what I typed was not what I intended to type. That's kind of what I thought. <laughs> like, you want me to go back? We just finished there. You want me to go back and just yeah. So there we go. Sorry about that. That was okay. uh, I, I fat fingered that one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> For the, okay, everybody watching at home is that we have a little private chat in our thing where I can send Mr. Grizzly a couple of messages on timestamps so I don't always have to say them out loud, which helps the episode run more smoothly. And I uh, told him to go back five minutes. <laughs> Not what we're supposed to do. Here Oops. we go. And thanks to our bipartisan infrastructure law, 46,000 new projects have been announced all across your communities. And by the way, I noticed some of you have strongly voted against it or they're cheering on that money coming in. <laughs> yeah. I like it. I'm with you. I'm with you. And if any of you don't want that money in your district, just let me know. Modernize our roads and bridges, ports and airports, public transit systems. Removing po poisonous lead pipes so every child can drink clean water without risk of brain damage. <clears throat> Providing affordable, affordable high-speed internet for every American, no matter where you live, urban, suburban, or rural communities, in red states and blue states. Record investments in tribal communities. Because of my investment in a family farm. Because I invested in a family farm led by my sector of agriculture and knows more about this than anybody I know. We're better. I just, the man's bringing it home. Was that the full clip? Well, that's where you told me to stop. I stopped okay. it where you told me to. Actually, I'm, I'm one second over. <laughs> oh okay did you have your uh, your time stamps wrong it happens well that's what i wrote well yeah, keep it going 10640 i'm stopped at 10641 yeah keep it going then yeah. just a second better able to stay in the family for the those farms for the and their children or grandchildren won't have to leave leave home to make a living it's transformative the great comeback story is Belvedere, Illinois. Oh, no. Home okay. auto plant for nearly 60 years. I, yeah. Okay, that's really weird. Oh, well. <laughs> I, was do, I, I was doing it at nearly 2 in the morning. So. That is probably why. Uh, Could very well be why man. you make mistakes. And hey, this time change really does mess with your head. Because yeah. technically speaking, it is uh, 10 to 7, but it's actually 10 to 8 now. Yeah, so, and yeah. Uh, but he he was uh, talking about um, also because indigenous issues almost never ever ever get mentioned or gotten to the state of the address, and he had uh, mentioned something there, so I wanted to to highlight it, but I guess I got the wrong timestamp there. Yeah. Um, he later uh, then one thing that was really interesting uh, that I noticed too is that. Um, 
both uh, President Biden and in the response, uh, what I call of them, I, I say, they both had a chumba-wumba moment where they both talked about getting knocked down and getting back up again. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, no. <laughs> that and the Rick, yeah. that and being rickrolled. Nobody, nobody made it. Nobody rickrolled though. Nobody said, "Well, never, never give up and never let you down." But, <laughs> but they got knocked down and got back up again. Well, that's why you got to vote for Rick Astley for president, right? Never going to give you up. Never going to let you down. Never going to run around or desert you. <laughs> never going to tell a lie. Never going to make you cry. Never going to say. Never going to say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Just give me um, a second here. I, I I need to take care of something quickly. I'll be right back. All right. Um, and now, of course, right? He's talking about the the infrastructure money, and you know how all the Republicans, of course, oppose the infrastructure money. But every time that there's an announcement, they keep on showing up at the ribbon cutting and going, "I did that," even though they voted against it. Because, as we keep on saying on the show, conservatives always say, "No, no, no," but they always show up to take the dough. <laughs> oh man they do protest way too damn much um so by now kits you're getting the sense yes kit mr cal exactly biden seems to care about his legacy good for the people Go good for the people, and the people will hopefully reward you. Yes, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. And uh, hopefully, you know, because there's uh, in inflation is much, uh, not much lower, but is lower in the United States than it is here. Uh, they're already close to their 2% target, and the economy is, do is doing well, as is ours. Um, but they're they're a little ahead of us on uh, getting the inflation uh, number down. Um, you know, with the election coming up, people are starting to feel uh, that in the United States, uh, consumer confidence indicators and stuff of the like are starting to trend upward. And so reversing a pretty longer term negative trend you know, and, uh, yeah, when you had the, the supply chain issues and the interest rate rising. And uh, that's something that's going to be happening here as well relatively soon enough because according to the Bank of, well, not the Bank of Canada itself, but Bank of Canada watchers, uh, they're still claiming that interest rates will start decreasing uh, somewhere in the spring or summer of this year and that uh, by the end of this year, uh, we will have inflation pretty much permanently under the 3%, between 2 and 3% and closer to 2 by the time the next election comes along. And uh, yeah, you mentioned, Mr. Grizzly, I believe on a previous show, that uh, we're getting close to having 600,000 uh, housing units started. Uh, the Correct. most recent numbers are 750,000 now with the, wow. the federal government's accelerator program. So all these things are going to start showing up at some point. People are going to start seeing the projects being built in their neighborhoods. They're going to feel their interest. Or they're going to see their interest rate to declining. They're going to see inflation get back to a normal range. And, That's uh, what the uh, young people say, uh, kicking ass and taking names. Yeah. So the, these trends that we're seeing in the United States are, are also going to be hidden here. Mm -hmm. um, now, the next place that Mr. Uh, President Biden went to, of course, would be... Um, the signature piece of legislation from his term as vice president, which is Obamacare or the American Health Act. And um, he had some interesting things to say about that as well. Okay, let's have a look. Same drug, same place. Folks, the Affordable Care Act, the old Obamacare, it's still a very big deal. <laughs> he didn't say BFD. Yeah. Over 100 million of you can no longer be denied health insurance because of pre-existing condition. But well, my predecessor, many in this chamber, 
want to take this prescription drug away by repealing the Affordable Care Act. I'm not going to let that happen. <laughs> we stopped you 50 times before and we'll stop you again. In fact, I'm not only protecting it, I'm expanding it. Good. The, we the enacted tax credits of $800 per person per year reduce health care costs for millions of working families. That tax credit expires next year. I want to make that savings permanent. To state the obvious, women are more than half our population, but research on women's health has always been underfunded. That's why we're launching the first ever White House initiative on women's health research, led by Jill, doing an incredible job as First Lady. So pass my plan for $12 billion to transfer women's health research and benefit millions of lives all across America. Well, so, Joe coming in hot. He knows who his target demo is for the next election. Oh, yeah. Yes. And that's something that, uh, that's a policy. That I'm sure that policy watchers in Canada were taking some notes. And um, there's absolutely no reason why our prime minister couldn't join in on such an initiative. Well, one of the things that he's, he's done, which is uh, monumental, is the amount of student uh, debt relief. Mm -hmm. that he's, he's the campaign, he campaigned on it and he followed through and he's relieved so much student debt. And the, the thing is, you've got angry people go, well, I had to pay. You should too. It's like, except you got your education 25 years ago. And yes, it was very expensive at the time and no doubt it was difficult. But it's not as ridiculous as it is today. The average student, if you graduate from medical school in the United States of America, it's going to take you 15 years in practice, sometimes 20, depending upon where you went to school, mm -hmm. before you can pay off your debts. Yeah. Jay, so you're, you're just starting, paying you're off starting the out. Loan. You're starting out a 100 meter race, 50 meters back of the starting blocks. Yeah. You're running a 100 meter race, but you have to run 150 meters. So, you know, you look at it from the, the standpoint of how are we supposed to get people upwardly mobile and being able to spend and put money into the economy by, by crippling them. And I hate using that term, but I don't know what other term, hobbling, crippling, what, what other term could I use? Uh, hampering them with debt? Hampering doesn't have quite the same sort of uh, weight to it. But starting out in life you know you've just finished school you're going to get your first job your first probably your first apartment your or your first home or whatever the case may be and you've got so much debt to deal with how are you supposed to save money to buy a house how yeah. are you supposed to actually get ahead when you're starting like i said 50 meters back of the starting blocks yeah so you know yeah you got kid jim in the chat going i paid my student loan at 21 percent interest and i want university free for anyone who has the marks to be there Got Hugh to uh, get Hugh going. Education is an investment that returns two dollars for every public dollar invested. It's not a handout; it's an investment in the economy. Exactly. And Jim, it, that that's that's a crazy interest rate. But yeah, I feel the same way now. Now I went to college. I didn't go to university uh, because you know I was still struggling with what I want to do with my life. So I went to college to do what I was doing, just so I had some documentation to say I knew how to do what I was doing. But it wasn't my dream and the program I was on was a pilot program by the province of Ontario so all it cost me was time there was no financial investment from my part so I was very lucky but the program has since migrated and changed and they don't even call it the same thing anymore of course that was in the 90s when I went to school so that's a long time ago 20 when did I graduate 99 so 25 years ago the programs all changed and and again even at that time, I could have afforded student loans because they weren't as predatory as, as, and ridiculous as they are today. And prior to the Mike Harris government in the province of Ontario, student loans were done by the province. He handed it over to the private sector. And you know what the private sector is? Banking. And you know what banking is? Profit. So guess what, students? You are merely a profit wing of the national banks in the province of Ontario. It should not be 
handed to the private sector. Public sector should uh, run it, fund it, and charge minimal interest like they used to. Uh, also, if memory serves, OSAP at one point in time, you were given, was it a year or two years of leeway when you got into the workforce before you had to start paying off your loan? I believe so, yeah. And now I think it's two months after you graduate, they want you to start paying whether you're working or not because it's private sector for profit. Handing over a public institution to the private sector is a terrible, terrible idea because they are motivated by one thing and one thing only, profit, which means you will get gouged, you will get harmed, you will get crushed because they don't care about you. They only care about returning to their shareholders. And each quarter, we need a little bump in that profit margin. Oh, by the way, if you're looking to invest right now, in about two weeks time, if you can, I would say look at stocks in Apple and Tesla because it will be the government, uh, the year end in the United States where they have to have their tax returns in by March 30th or 31st, I can't remember, but the end of March, they have to have their tax returns in. Wealthy people tend to dump a lot of Apple stock at this time, which tanks the price. This is historically proven. It tanks the price, so what they do is they dump the stock so that they can show that the portfolio is worth less so they don't have to pay as much in tax. So it's a good time to invest in Tesla or Apple or some of those other big companies right now. So I'm just letting you know. Just keep your eye on the stocks. They'll dip a bit, and then they'll come back up come uh, a, uh, May, June sort of thing. Right. Well, it's interesting that you were talking about student loans because the next section is about education. Oh, wow. It picks up where we left off, does it, or is it? Uh, One hundred seven ten. Oh yeah. Okay, I see it. Yeah. Sorry, I just I just saw your thing there. No worries. No worries. Let's advance a bit here. Let's see. Let's see what else do we have here from the kids here? Yep. Yeah. Indeed, that was a Doug Ford decision. Yes, it is, Mister Cal. Because especially particularly in Ontario, because Kathleen Wynne had made tuition free. Yeah. 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 All right. Let's, uh, let's have a look. The strongest economy in the world. We need to have the best education system in the world. And I, like I suspect all of you, want to give a child, every child, a good start by providing access to preschool for three and four years old. You know, I think I pointed out last year I think I pointed out last year that children coming from broken homes where there's no books, they're not read to, not spoken to very often, start school, kindergarten, or first grade, hearing, having heard a million fewer words spoken. Well, studies show that children who go to preschool are nearly 50 percent more likely to finish high school, go on to earn a two- and four-year degree, no matter what their background is. Yeah, I did not know that. Mm -hmm. I met a year and a half ago with the leaders of the business roundtable. They were mad that I, they were angry. I said, well, they were d discussing why I wanted to spend money on education. I pointed out to them, as vice president, I met with over eight, I think it was 182 of those folks. Don't hold me the exact number. And uh, I asked them what they need most, the CEOs. And you've had the same experience on both sides now. They say a better educated workforce, right? So I looked at them, and I say, I come from Delaware. DuPont used to be the eighth largest corporation in the world. And every new inter enterprise they bought, they educated the workforce to that enterprise. But none of you do that anymore. Why are you angry with me, providing you the opportunity for the best educated workforce in the world? And they all looked at me and said, I think you're right. I want to expand high-quality tutoring and summer learning to see that every child learns to read by third grade. I'm also connecting local businesses and high schools so students get hands-on experience and a path to good-paying job whether or not they go to college. So, those uh, data and statistics that you said you didn't know, I wasn't aware of them either. Mm -hmm. 
kind of makes our prime minister's decision to um, support child care and not just regular ch child care with this, but child care that has an early learning component to it. Like a much better investment now, doesn't it? Certainly would appear to be, yes. Imagine that. Mm. Getting early childhood education at the ages three or four increases your odds by 50% no matter what your background is, of going on to higher education. That's some wild we all benefit. Right all of us right now, we're like, you know, 40, 50. Mm -hmm. We're going to benefit from that. Because there's going to be a lot of us. And we're going to need them to keep us in our retirement. <laughs> you think? You want a very well-educated population to make sure that you have a good standard of living in your retirement. Oh, yeah. Right? So um, a good investment all around. Um, he goes on to talk about uh, the national debt in that and uh, mentions that uh, he signed a bipartisan budget deal to cut another trillion dollars over the decade, and he, he has a goal to cut the federal deficit by $3 trillion more by making corporations pay their fair share of taxes. He said, look, I'm a capitalist. If you want to make a million bucks, great. Just pay your fair share in taxes. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. And speaking of the student loans, uh, Mr. Grizzly, um, because Mr. Uh, President Biden had come in with a plan to forgive a whole lot of student loans, and you know the Republicans said, "No, you can't do that," and took it to the Supreme Court, and they actually won it. So he's been doing it in little chunks here and there, as he can. And each little chunk looks small and not particularly significant, but when you add it all up, he has now canceled debt of in a total of 138 billion dollars 138 four, billion wow for almost four million americans well and when you consider it, people we can't afford to be uh, actually yeah here's the thing you know how many ppp loans were forgiven and those loans were given to very wealthy people during mm. the pandemic mm -hmm. right but they were mm. forgiven marjorie taylor green is one one example of someone who took ppp loans yes she yes. did indeed she did <laughs> seem to forget about that you can't have debt relief well what about your ppp loans are you going to pay them back i don't know look over there look over there look over there joe biden joe biden uh, joe biden <laughs> they got nothing man <laughs> no they don't um and then you know you get the other issues of you know border security and talking about because that seems to be a big thing the republicans always uh want to want to talk about that and remember they had that deal that the republicans had asked for that the democrats agreed to and then donald trump came in and said no don't sign that deal because i need this issue to help me win the election and if you sign this border security deal and everybody says that it's fixed then i can't scare scare the neighbors about the brown people crossing the border and then they swallowed themselves whole and didn't sign that bill well, that bill would have hired 1,500 more border security agents and, some off, agents and officers, 100 more immigration judges to help tackle a backload of 2 million cases. There would have been 4,300 more asylum officers and new policies so that they could resolve cases in six months rather than six years. There would have been 100 more high-tech drug detection machines to significantly increase the ability to screen and stop vehicles from smuggling fentanyl into the United States. The Border Patrol Union endorsed the bill. The Chamber of Commerce endorsed the bill. And Biden actually outright said, quote, I believe that given the opportunity, a majority of the House and Senate would endorse it as well. But then there was Trump. And therefore, it didn't happen. What? Oh, yes, right. Yes, yes, yes. I do know yep. what you're talking about. Yes. Yep. Yep. Even, and there was a number of Republicans who actually said, this is a good plan. <laughs> they asked for it. Yeah. Like, this is actually good. They asked good. for this plan. Yeah. Now, the other this big what issue. what we want. Deliver on it. Okay, here you go. Wait, wait a second. Wait, wait. Is this, did he give us? Wait. We have to protest somehow. <laughs> we can't give him a win. 
Uh, then the other issue in the United States, right, because border security is the first one that seems to come around often, and the, the other perpetual issue is voting rights. Right. Mr. Biden, President, I keep on saying Mr. instead of President. President Biden had a lot to say about that as well. Okay, well, let's just have a look then, shall we? A transformational hist moment in history happened 58, 59 years ago today in Selma, Alabama. Hundreds of foot soldiers for justice marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, named after the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan, to claim their fundamental right to vote. They were beaten, they were bloody, and left for dead. Our late friend and former colleague John Lewis was on that march. We miss him. Joining us tonight, our other marchers, both in the gallery and on the floor, including Betty Mae Fikes, known as the voice of Selma, the daughter of gospel singers and preachers. She sang songs of prayer and protest on that bloody Sunday to help shake the nation's conscience. Five months later, the Voting Rights Act passed them a sign in the law. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But 59 years later, their force has taken us back in time. Voter suppression, election subversion, unlimited dark money, Extreme gerrymandering. John Lewis is a great friend to many of us here. But if you truly want to honor him and all the heroes of march with him, then it's time to do more than talk. Pass the Freedom to Vote Act. The John Lewis Voting Right Act. And stop. Stop denying another core value of America, our diversity across American life. Banning books, it's wrong. Instead of erasing history, let's make history. I want to protect fundamental rights. Pass the Equality Act. And my message to transgender Americans, <clears throat> I have your back. Wow. Pass the PRO Act for workers' rights. He's really hitting some home runs there. <laughs> he really, really, really is. Well, and you know what he's doing, too. Um, he, he's, uh, was it Truman or FDR with the New Deal? It was FDR with the New Deal. Yes. Uh, and that New Deal was written by a Canadian economist, J.K. Galbraith, by the way. Um, the New Deal is what created... Uh, the America that that rose out of the depression and became the most powerful economic powerhouse in the world with the largest middle class in the world which was not you know at the time middle class wasn't too much of a thing uh, mm -hmm. post uh, post first world war and, and during the depression but afterwards as you know the war raged world war ii raged on and gave you the fabulous 50s and the uh, tumultuous 60s and then the 70s and then the boomers can you know, you know Let's not talk about what the boomers did. We won't. We won't pick on anybody today, even though mm. you know I feel I have the license to do so because thank you for pissing it mm -hmm. up with the rest of us. But uh, it was it was the New Deal from FDR that really did uh, change America and make it the modern society that it became. That was uh, the example for the rest of the world to look up to, and and did like a lot of the modern uh, union uh, wages and. Uh, things that are taken for granted in countries like Canada and throughout, throughout Europe, Scandinavia specifically, most of those ideo ideologies came from the United States of America. And Americans don't even know that. Okay. That's, the, that's the funny thing, right? Like the amount of Americans that do not know that the social programs and the, uh, that exist throughout Scandinavia were thought of 
and they, they saw what they were doing in America and said, this is good. Let's do this. Let's duplicate it. The thing was, they did not allow people to get into power that would, that would shit on everybody. And yeah, here you go, Mr. Cal, Ronald Reagan. Once he got elected, that's when it all changed. It all got reversed because when Dwight D. Eisenhower was the president, you know, the former Supreme Allied commander in World War II, the guy responsible for the D-Day invasion, when he was the president, the corporate tax weight was 90%. So companies, to reduce their corporate rate, it, and it was 90% over X number of millions of dollars. It wasn't 90% if you earned a buck. It was 90% over, I think, 10 or 20 million or whatever the case was. Arbitrary figures by today's standards, right? But once you earned over that, your tax rate jumped up to 90%. So what did companies do? They would reinvest their, their funds into the company to provide things for employees. They would give them new education programs, create savings programs, build actual pension programs. So that lowered the corporate tax rate of the company and improved the lives of their employees. And the ones who did have to pay the 90%, well, that just helped build things like roads, highways, schools, airports, basic infrastructure. That all went away when Reagan took power because he cut it down to 70% and then 50% and then I think 20% when he left office is what it was at in an eight-year period. He, he espoused the trickle-down effect, which we know has never worked, ever. And what did George Carlin say? The trickle-down effect. They're literally pissing on you, and you're supposed to enjoy it. The trickle-down effect of, econ uh, of economics has never worked. Because what happens is the wealthy get more money, they just hoard it and keep it for themselves. It's been proven time and time and time again. You are absolutely, absolutely correct. Trickle-down has not worked at all. It and never. Uh, we actually have some world leaders starting to mention it and uh, you know, say it out loud, which is kind of nice, uh, Biden being one of them, actually. Um, now, the next couple of uh, moments uh, that I'm going to show uh, are important to us as Canadians uh, because they have to do with uh, climate policy and uh, later on the Israel-Palestine conflict. Uh, okay. So we'll start with uh, climate policy because the you know, U.S. leads the way there and, you know, we kind of follow in certain mm. aspects here. Raise the federal minimum wage because every worker has a right to a decent living more than a seven bucks an hour. We're also making history by confronting the climate crisis, not denying it. I don't think any of you think there's no longer a climate crisis. At least I hope you don't. I'm taking the most significant action ever on climate in the history of the world. Wow. I'm cutting our carbon emissions in half by 2030, creating tens of thousands of clean energy jobs like the IBW work is building and installing 500,000 electric vehicle charging stations. <laughs> Conserving 30% of America's lands and waters by 2030. And taking action on environmental justice fence line communities smothered by the legacy of pollution pattern after the Peace Corps and America Corps, I launched the Climate Corps to put 20,000 young people to work in the forefront of our clean energy future. I'll triple that number in a decade. Well, Joe's, Joe's just, um, he's just hitting them out of the park. Yep. So here we go. Daniel Smith, mm -hmm. if Joe Biden yeah. is going to cut emissions in half by 2030. Who are you going to sell your In the United to? States. Yeah. With Texas. Yeah. There, and you're saying it's not possible to do it in Canada until 2050? And correct me if I'm wrong, isn't, isn't the United States of America oil independent now? They don't import uh -huh. oil anymore. They, mm -hmm. they, and they haven't in a number of years. They've been self-dependent on oil for a number of years because well of that's that's the thing that screwed us over right yes everybody in alberta did the same you know that whole thing right you know ewers of water and that all express from canada right we pull stuff out of the ground and we put it on a train and then we ship it and then we buy it back at five times the price yes and because it's oil well executives just like sit there put their hands there behind their heads and put their their shoes on the desk and go ah aren't we great aren't we yeah. fantastic managers mm -hmm like this and you know the united states will always buy our product and then well until they don't the wolf 
<laughs> stuff happened. War happened. Yeah. 9-11 happened. And all of a sudden the United States decided, hey, we're going to be energy independent because they kept on saying that. And then they never actually did it. But then they actually did it. And then all of a sudden everybody in Alberta turned around and says, ooh, our biggest client has now suddenly become our biggest competition. What do we do now? We didn't plan for that. Well, no. That's why you didn't build any refineries over 25 or 30 years. And that's yeah. why you didn't really save because you thought that the United States was always be there to buy from us. All you had to do is pull it out of the ground, put it on a train, and ship it down, you know, just down south a little bit. And it's easy money. Cha-ching. Well, any remember, idiot can do that. It doesn't make you a great manager until things change. We things closed change. all our refineries in Canada. We used to yeah. have a massive one in, in the East Island of Montreal. There yep. was a massive refinery, so big that it was on the back of the $10 bill, if you're old enough to remember that. Mm -hmm. And that's yep. been closed for 25 years. Yep. And the cleanup is going to take many decades. They're trying to figure out what to do because it's a giant chunk of land right in the heart of Montreal. Mm -hmm. They're trying to figure out what to do with it, and they realize it's going to take decades to clean it. And it might never be habitable by human beings. Yep. Because... And then what he talked about later on about the creation of a climate core. Mm -hmm. There's absolutely no reason for whatsoever for, for which a similar initiative could not be done here. And funded the community service initiative that has something to do with the climate. And Prime Minister Trudeau wants to speak to people 30 and under. Well, people 30 and under are looking at, hey man, I'd like to have a planet to live on. Yep. There's a piece of policy. There's a piece of policy that you can borrow. Hey, politics, a lot of it is about stealing good ideas. Oh, yeah. Well, a lot it, of what's the old ideas. What's the old adage? Um, good artists create, great artists steal. <laughs> yep, exactly. It's an old adage. So we'll continue from this point because this is another instance of him, uh, of a heckler coming in, and um, he handles it quite well. Okay, let's have a look. As we pick up right at the right at the time mark you gave me. Yep. To state the obvious, all Americans deserve the freedom to be safe. And America is safer today than when I took office. The year before I took office, murder rates went up thirty percent. Thirty percent they went up. The biggest increase in history. It was then, through, no, through my American Rescue Plan, which every American voted against, I'm mad at, we made the largest investment in public safety ever. Last year, the murder rate saw the sharpest decrease in history. Violent crime fell to one of its lowest levels in more than 50 years. But we have more to do. We have to help cities invest in more community police officers, more mental health workers, more community violence intervention. Give communities the tool to crack down on gun crime, retail crime, and carjacking. Keep building trust, as they've been doing by taking executive action on police reform and calling for it to be the law. So, again, Heckler, this one from the audience. Biden just continues on. Yeah, just acted like nothing happened. Acted like nothing. Compare and contrast with um, Skippy. Yeah. yeah. Compare and contrast with what happened this weekend. Oh, the Skippy's rally. Oh, no, I missed that. Oh, the oh. guy who held up the uh, sign. Yeah, they immediately. Yes, there was a guy that held up a sign and uh, immediately uh, got uh, taken down. Um, I don't have the clip with me handy because I'm doing this, but this made me think of that. Um, and uh, he was um, escorted out by police officers, which is very, very, very wrong, actually, because... Um, in Canada, you're allowed to protest, and if you go to a political rally and are disruptive, as this person was, but are not violent and are not posing any threat, that should be for event security to deal with, not the police. Because you have done nothing wrong and you have done nothing criminal. The police shouldn't have to put a hand on you. That should be event security because if something happens, it should be the fault of the party for not having hired or briefed or trained their security well enough. 
but this man in Hamilton, I believe it was, mm -hmm. was escorted out by police officers from a political event for merely having been disruptive, but not violent or threatening. I have, I have a little bit of the clip. We should not be paying for that. This is uh, from Karina. Uh, I have some of the clip here. I'll show you. Yep. Yeah. Okay. If I can get it on the screen. Here we go. It's, it's quite loud, so. That's very concerning. Why are there police officers in the room providing security? Well, apparently they had a mounted uh, police. Police horses were on standby outside his Axe the Tax rally. I got a clip from Karina here about just that. I'm like, what the hell is going on here? Um, so he has armed police officers mounted police officers for his own rally i don't understand that i really yeah. don't here's the here's clip with karima check this out uh, this is puzzling to me why would he do that even the horses came out to play if you ask me yeah i don't know how the party arranged for that i don't know i don't know I, I why no the idea. police force would agree to that um the young man in question his name is keith stewart uh, he tweeted tweeted i briefly held up an act on climate now greenpeace.ca banner at polyviev's toronto acts the tax rally cpc has no plan to deal with climate crisis that drove over 160,000 canadians from their homes fleeing wildfires last summer or farmers looking at another bone dry summer uh bone dry summer sorry so i um i'm gonna try to reach out to this young man mm -hmm. if we can uh, get him on the show i have uh, a i have a screen cap here i'm showing you from shit given uh, extraordinaire Andrew Lawton. An apple a day keeps the journalists away, Polyev says to a lot of applause. Uh, that's a danger to, mo to democracy. An apple a day keeps the journalists away. What an asshole. What a raging asshole. Like, yeah. Jesus Christ, man. He's referring to his apple moment, right? It's like, y you do realize that when you shun journalists, it's because you're trying to hide something. Mm hmm. They're trying to kill our democracy. Yeah. And here's a, another thing here about this photo, actually, Mr. Grizzly, if you put it up. Um, the person who is uh, tackling Mr. Stewart to the ground mm -hmm. is clearly not an officer. No, no, no. Now, I don't know if this is somebody that was maybe embedded and undercover. Don't know. In, in plain clothes. We don't know. Uh, but if this is just an ordinary citizen. That's uh, assault. Yeah, you committed a crime, sir. Yeah. Uh, and all he did was hold up a banner. Because um, if somebody is at a protest and they unfurl a banner or they start heckling, or not, but they're otherwise not being violent or threatening, it is up to event security Correct. to handle the issue. It's not up to citizens to tackle the person or wrestle that person to the ground. And there certainly should not be police officers in the room doing security detail for a political rally like this, which is, again, we're not in an election campaign. We're not in an election period. This is a private event by a private organization because political parties are private organizations. They're guest lists. This is not open to the public. They can control who gets in and who doesn't. 
police should not be providing security within that room. If there was an incident where someone was violent, security would be calling police in, who are probably around the event, providing some security at the perimeter, that's fine, to come in and handle it. But the police officers should not have been the people laying hands on that man to escort him out of that room. That should frighten. Yeah. And it should frighten people because this party is currently the opposition. And for some reason, they have the ability to make that happen. Check this out. Imagine when they're the government. Check this out. This is wild. Um, this is from Karima as well. A bushel of apples on stage at Pierre Polyev's X the Tax rally. This is a callback to the vineyard where the conservative leader chomped on an apple during an interview to show irreverence towards media. The progression of bites suggests it was more of a skit than anything else. And yep, look at that. Bushel of apples. Yep, he has that. It's standard now. Yeah. At his events. Look at that child there. <laughs> and t-shirts. WTF t-shirts, of course, in the basket. Yeah, the, the, the uh, child there with the axe, the tax. She looks like she's so happy to be there. Yep, the, the, we call that grooming. Yeah. We call that grooming political. Again, no, no child under six or seven or eight comes up with the idea themselves of axe the tax or defund the CVZ. Oh, so here's something funny. So I read you that quote from Andrew Lawton, an apple a day keeps the journalists away. Mm -hmm. Apparently he said something a little bit different than that. Let me just... You all can't even bring it home. I can't hear you. Sorry. Something's going weird with the That is very rude, I'm sorry. You know what? You know what they say? An apple a day keeps the liberal journalists away. Oh, keeps the liberal journalists away. Oh, keeps the yeah. liberal journalists yeah. away. A little clever editing there from Matt Lawton. Yeah, he left that part out. I wonder why he did that. No, well, because Skippy doesn't have a problem with all... Well, sorry, I shouldn't say he doesn't have a problem with all journalists. He doesn't have a problem with all people who call themselves journalists. Hello, other True North. Looking at you. We were True North first. By the way. <laughs> yeah, by the way. Oh, man. All right. Getting back to the State of the Union. Uh, this is very important because uh, this is where the United States is currently standing on the Israel and Palestine issue, at least for the purposes of the State of the Union. We all know that um, there is still some, while the United States is trying to get Israel to like, dude, like, pull back and like do some minimum to try and help Palestinian people mm -hmm. um, because you're making it very hard for us to be in your camp. Yeah. Um, that's the diplomatic conversation. Okay. But, well, let's bring it up then. I got the clip here. Then there's the public one. And owners. You know, as we manage challenges at home, we're also managing crisis abroad, including in the Middle East. I know the last five months have been gut-wrenching for so many people, for the Israeli people, for the Palestinian people, and so many here in America. This crisis began on October 7th with a massacre by a terrorist group called Hamas, as you all know. 1,200 innocent people, women and girls, men and boys, slaughtered after enduring sexual violence. The deadliest day of the, for the Jewish people since the Holocaust and 250 hostages taken. Here in this chamber tonight are families whose loved ones are still being held by Hamas. I pledge to all the families that we will not rest until we bring every one of your loved ones home. We also... We will also work around the clock to bring home Evan and Paul, Americans being unjustly detained by the Russians. 
and others around the world. Israel has the right to go after Hamas. Hamas ended this conflict by releasing hostages, laying down arms, could end it by, by releasing the hostages, laying down arms, and sur surrendering those responsible for October 7th. But Israel has a <coughs> excuse me, Israel has a added burden because Hamas hides and operates among the civilian population like cowards under hospitals, daycare centers, and all the like. Israel also has a fundamental responsibility, though, to protect innocent civilians in Gaza. <clears throat> this war... has taken a greater toll on innocent civilians than all previous wars in Gaza combined. More than 30,000 Palestinians have been killed, most of whom are not Hamas. Thousands and thousands of innocents, women and children, girls and boys, also orphaned. Nearly 2 million more Palestinians under bombardment or displacement. Homes destroyed, neighbors in rubble, cities in ruin, families without food, water, medicine. It's heartbreaking. I've been working nonstop to establish an immediate ceasefire that would last for six weeks to get all the prisoners released, all the hostages released, to get the hostages home and ease the intolerable and humanitarian crisis and build toward an enduring, a more something more enduring. The United States has been leading international efforts to get more humanitarian assistance to Gaza. Tonight, I'm directing the U.S. military to lead an emergency mission to establish a temporary pier in the Mediterranean on the coast of Gaza that can receive large shipments carrying food, water, medicine, and temporary shelters. No U.S. boots will be on the ground. A temporary pier will enable a massive increase in the amount of humanitarian assistance getting into Gaza every day. <clears throat> and Israel must do its part. Israel must allow more aid into Gaza and ensure humanitarian workers aren't caught in the crossfire. And they're announcing they're going to they're going to call, have a crossing in northern Gaza. To the leadership of Israel, I say this: humanitarian assistance cannot be a secondary consideration or a bargaining chip. Protecting and saving innocent lives has to be a priority. As we look to the future, the only real solution to the situation is a two-state solution over time. <clears throat> and I say this, as a lifelong supporter of Israel, my entire career, no one has a stronger record with Israel than I do. I challenge any of you here. I'm the only American president of Israel in wartime, but there is no other path that guarantees Israel's security and democracy. There is no other path that guarantees that Palestinians can live in peace with, with peace and dignity. And there's no other path that guarantees peace between Israel and all of its neighbors, including Saudi Arabia, with whom I'm talking. Creating stability in the Middle East also means containing the threat posed by Iran. That's why I build a coalition of more than a dozen countries to defend international shipping and freedom of navigation in the Red Sea. So, those two initiatives tacked on uh, incre increasing access to the Red Sea. That's where uh, the events that are happening involving the Houthis in Yemen, Houthi rebels, are taking place, making it difficult or more difficult to have a safe passage through the Red Sea. And the idea of that pier we have a kit hue here that says uh, the pier is a great idea those are things that you're going to start hearing a lot about more on the international scene which means it's going to come into canadian politics and our parties are going to have to probably take some stances on these things um, so these are things that are going to for, further complicate the narrative and you're going to start hearing about it when we're going to be talking about the israel and palestine situation um and uh, you know our various parties will take uh, the positions uh, that they have that they that they will on these things, but uh, yeah, as Kit's use as a full one third of global trade goes through the Red Sea, yeah, and uh, as we mentioned on a previous show, there are lots of people now that uh, nations that are doing their shipping by going all the way around through the south of Africa, 
uh, southern tip of Africa rather than through the Red Sea, which is, again, yeah, hearkening time. back to the days when shipping costs were going up uh, because mm -hmm. of supply chain disruptions during COVID, once again. And there's no Western democratic government that really wants that come in into election season. <laughs> ha, higher shipping costs at this particular time. Um, then after that, of course, so th that was the last big point. And then, of course, Joe Biden had a typical big finish um, with these uh, State of the Union things, which, uh, you know, I, I could show it. But you know how all these things go where, you know, the volume gets a little, uh, goes a little bit more up, the speed mm -hmm. goes a little bit more up, and it's delivered and it's hammered home. And he nailed that, uh, which caused everybody to sort of... Um, Gee, I doubted him, but maybe he really does have a chance at this. And wow, he was really sharp tonight. And wow, if there were any doubters, he surely silenced them. And uh, that was the big buzz. So his State of the Union speech did do, and then some, mm -hmm. that which people were saying needed to be done for him to sort of put that stuff at rest about him not being ready, not being prepared and all that kind of stuff. Now, that's not going to stop the Republicans, of course, because, well, once they have a narrative, they never leave it under any circumstance whatsoever. True. Right. That's, again, whatever reality is, we disregard that and we continue on. That is the conservative playbook at the moment. Um, but anybody who stopped in to watch that or anybody who, you know, the people who don't watch it because people, you know, Right with social media, you're going for the clips. Just basically had clip after clip after clip mm -hmm. after clip of him showing that he had it together. He was on top of it, delivering it well. Now, of course, we also know that President Biden, over the course of his life, had to overcome a stutter, mm -hmm. which sometimes shows up a little bit when he uh, does his speech. It's normal. It's normal. There were a couple of little moments, as we saw. Uh, which caused, of course, the former president who hasn't missed a disability, who's not willing to mock. Yeah, no kidding. To uh, attempt to make uh, fun of uh, Biden's stutter. Um, of course, that did not go over very well for the former president. Of course, it played well with all the usual suspects, right, that he appeals to. But uh, he, did not get good, good, he did not get overall good press because of that. Do you... Um... <laughs> I want to, I'm going to pivot a tiny little bit here. I say a tiny little bit because it's, it's going to be dealing with Israel um, and what's going on. But let me, I, I don't know if you saw this over the weekend or not. This was from, when was this? Was this Friday? Yeah, this was Friday evening. Friday at uh, about 5.18 p.m. according to the timestamp. This was a tweet from uh, Pierre Polyev. I'll read it out for the, the folks mm. at home. Trudeau paused, in quotation marks, UN RWA funding because of ties to terrorists and revelations that their employees took part in the October 7th attacks. A month later, he flip-flops. Hot, introduce yourself to the kettle. His next step, he will send out his MPs from Jewish writings to criticize the latest decision so that liberals can be all things to all people. I'm sorry, he did what? He's gonna what? Jewish writings? What could you I'm sorry, what is that again now? I don't believe that is a thing because it isn't. Uh, can you say anti Semitism? Uh, yeah. We have a Tab Tabitha Southey, who's a respected journalist, mm -hmm. a self described ink stained wretch. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly, but, uh, Donna. Exactly, Donna. What's a Jewish writing? Exactly. Writes for Maclean's, for Walrus Magazine, Globe and Mail, National Post, El Canada. It's been published all over. And um, Jewish writings, quote unquote, this isn't a slip of the tongue. Poyev, who aims to represent Canada on the world stage, typed this out, proofread it, and then posted it, and there better be some pointed follow-up questions. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty, it's pretty it's yeah. bad. It's bad. And Jeremy it's Apple on Twitter said, can you imagine the response of someone who's anti-Zionist spoke of Jewish writings, quote unquote. Um, 
Lightning Cash or Extraordinaire. Really, Pyapoliev, do they control certain areas, gated communities, or are we back to Warsaw ghetto-type Jewish communities? You really just can't help the casual racism, can you? Um, here's the thing with Pierre Poliev. Um, He tr tried to cozy up to the convoy people and threw them under the bus. The first chance he got. Yeah, uh, cozied up to Ukrainians and threw them under the bus and then tried to cozy up to Ukrainians after throwing them under the bus. Mm -hmm. He's thrown gay people under the bus. Um, he's been campaigning uh, mercilessly, mercilessly against Arab Canadians pretty much since September 11th uh, and Muslim Canadians. And then um, comes this thing and uh, he goes all in for Israel fully all in throwing the over 1 million Arab and Muslim Canadians overboard. And then when he has his vote marathon votes against funding for a Holocaust museum votes against in Montreal votes against funding for a Jewish community center in Vancouver, and now starts making comments about Jewish writings, which mm -hmm. made a lot of people think about the time during the Harper government when uh, Jewish people started getting greeting cards and all of the Jewish community wondering, um, why does the prime minister of Canada have a list of Jewish people? How does he know I'm Jewish? Yeah. Um, yeah, the communities that he sorry. tries so hard to gain favor with, he then comes to a moment where he needs to throw a little red meat and does this to them. Makes these types of comments that are a little alarming and concerning. Yeah. There's no one he will not betray. There is no one he will not betray. He will suck up to you. He will put lips to butt and press firmly, but there is no one he will not betray. All he wants if is the power. Moment calls for it. He doesn't care. He will do anything to get it. Anything. He doesn't care about you. Yep. He will use you as a cudgel, as a wedge, as a sledge. He will yep. use you, and when he's done with you, he will toss you aside like he never met you. Yep. And it'd be like the Mariah Carey, I don't know her. Yep. And then he, of course, labels the pause, because it was a pause when it was discovered what happened right. with Unra, as a flip-flop to release the pause. It's not the a flip-flop. Flip -flop we is. put a pause. A pause means that there will be a decision to either stop totally or to re-engage. Mm. It's not a flip-flop. A flip-flop is saying, I will do one thing and then doing the other or saying, oh, no, I won't. Like Daniel Smith with her taxes or her energy rebate. Somebody's saying, hey, 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 whoa, there's something going on here. We're going to pause that. We're going to check it out. Okay, it seems to check out. We're going to do it again. It's not a flip-flop. It's not a flip-flop. He's trying to frame it as a flip-flop. We have Charles Adler says, Mr. Polyev, is it Canada that's broken or is it you? You're choosing to tag parts of our country in a way that doesn't seem Canadian. Quote, Jewish writings is your term. Will you name them and the liberal MPs representing them or does your grotesque ghetto politics have boundaries? Ooh, Charles is firing shots with that one. Andrew Perez, Pierre says that Trudeau will send his MPs into Jew Jewish writings to spend their decisions to resume UNRWA funding. I'm not fond of pearl clutching, but this reference is very troubling. Poliev could have just as easily said Muslim writings, Asian writings, Sikh writings, try Canadian writings. This sort of talk is representative of something corrosive in our politics, something all parties and their political organizations are complicit in. Parties must stop playing to diaspora politics, micro-targeting demographics, and pitting one ethnocultural group against another for perceived political gains. It's tribal behavior and has gone on far too long. I'm just reading something interesting here. Um, from The Breach, September 11th, 2023, it says nearly half of conservatives' governing executives are lobbyists. Nearly half. Yes. Yes. Holy shit. Yes. There are they 20... do not have your interest in mind, my friends. Yep. They have corporate interests in mind. 
Like we knew about uh, what's her name, uh, Sarah Byrne. Is Sarah Byrne? Jenny Byrne. Jenny Byrne. Yeah. Lobbyists for Loblaws, but nearly half of the governing MPs are lobbyists for big corporations. But they want to say they're for the common people. No, no, they are not. The common people are fodder for the economic meat grinder they will put us through if they ever gain power. I cannot stress enough how bad a reform government would be for this country because they are conservative in name only. Wow. Yeah. Half of them are lobbyists for big corporations. Half of them. Yeah, I think the there's story. 20 seats on the, the Conservative Council, and was it? How many of them are lobbyists? D d does the tweet mention it? It doesn't give me a number. It just says nearly It doesn't half. give me a number. Yeah, I, I saw the number at one point. I had, uh, it's, um, it, 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 it is concerning. And, um, you know, uh, Polyabad had come out and made this big statement about, you know, he'll be for the people and he won't be there for the lobbyists and lobbyists are, you know, a waste of money or that type of thing. And it's like, um, uh, Pierre, have you um, asked Jenny and uh, Melissa how they uh, feel about what you just said? He said corporate lobbyists in Ottawa are utterly useless. Yeah. And the governing council of the Conservative Party of Canada has a shit ton of them on the council. <laughs> Said nobody he will not throw under the bus. He, he just threw Jenny Byrne under the bus and she's basically the one who runs the Conservative Party. He doesn't and, care. And All a he wants is and a, majority, and a majority portion of the people who are on the council of the party. Are lobbyists. He will use you, chew you up, and spit you out. He doesn't care about you. He cares about himself getting power. That is it. I don't know how many times I can say that. But maybe people will start to believe us if we can get the message out to enough people to understand what this government, what if, what, no, sorry, what the conservative party, what the reform party calling themselves conservative would do to this country if they ever ascended to power, if they ever formed government. These are not good people. They do not have your interest in mind. Most of them are lobbyists for big corporations. What do you think they're going to do? We're going to ax the tax, which means we're going to cut services so we can give more money to corporations. How much corporate welfare will that party de uh, deliver? Because you know they'll be giving them grants left, right, and center. I mean, I'm still upset about Loblaws getting $12 million for new freezers. I know why it happened. Because they applied and they qualified. And if you if you can qualify, you can apply. Which is why they got it. I didn't like it. I understand that it does have economic benefits to all of us in the end. I just don't like it when a billion dollar corporation gets money from the taxpayer. That's my take. But the program is put together so that you can apply. And if you meet the criteria, here's the money. So nobody did anything wrong. I just didn't care for it. There's a yeah. difference. So we have a Biden State of the Union, and we have, hey, like I said, when I say that there was praise, we have Evan Scrimshaw here in Canada. It was a bit cynical. <laughs> I knew where this was, I knew where this ending was going before Joe even started it, but even my cold, cynical heart has only one response. Four more fucking years. Brian Behar. I had a lot of varied expectations for tonight's State of the Union. I did not expect to be crying at the end, but when President Biden summed up his story as a lifelong commitment to decency, compassion, optimism, and democracy, that got me where it counts. Peggy Blair, noted author. The problem when you keep telling public that a politician is old and demented and feeble is that when they turn out to be vigorous and passionate and clear-headed, you lose all credibility. And it just goes on and on and on and on rick wilson can we dispose with the media fantasy that biden isn't ready for the fight this speech was a barn burner i've heard a lot of state of union addresses in my lifetime i have to say that was beyond a doubt the best one i've ever heard i've seen it's just 
Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. 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 Michael Smirkanish working for CNN. Uh, Biden skeptic. I'm not sticking around for the post commentary. I know what I've just seen. If he had a bad night, I'd say so. But Joe Biden was strong tonight and anyone who says otherwise is wrong. And I've been clear about my own concerns as to his age, alacrity, not tonight. Mm -hmm. Now, um, if you watched Saturday Night Live, yeah, I did. I saw jo Scarlett Johansson on the cold open. Wow, that was good. Okay, we we can't um, play it. We can't play it. No, we can't play that. But what we can play is the speech is, she made fun of. Oh my speech word! She mocked the speech she mocked. Um, now here's What's her name? a Brit, pro Brit, tip. What's her name? Uh, Brit. Uh, Katie, Katie Britt, Britt. Yeah, Katie, Katie Britt. Britt. Now, um, for our American friends who do watch, uh, a very, very pro tip, and if there happen to be any uh, Republican viewers watching, um, in the United States is, if you are a member of the Republican Congress and you get asked or handed the quote-unquote, skip your quotes, honor, of delivering Ooh. the response to the State of the Union, don't accept it. Um, sirens, neon signs pointing to you, that's a sign that your party views you as a lamb they can afford to send to the slaughter. Because Some of the comments. <laughs> oh, my God. Republican responses to um i mean the most famous one is bobby jindal's yeah that, that one i can remember it's it's seared into my brain um it literally is yes exactly don't invade afghanistan and don't respond to the state of the union address one of the, uh, one of the you. comments she <laughs> delivers this whole thing like she just unalived the person who was supposed to give the speech yeah yeah Right. Oh, the one comment I, I wanted to make about, uh, before I get it about the Israel-Palestine thing, you will notice that he spent the majority of his time talking about doing well for Palestine and Israel's responsibilities. Mm. Yes, that also is a demographic thing because he's losing support. As in the primaries, there have been uh, campaigns to get people to vote uncommitted. And particular campaigns for um, Arab Americans and uh, their allies and supporters to vote uncommitted in the primaries. And uh, like for example, in Michigan, the uncommitted got over 10%. So as uh, Bo of the fifth column says, that's enough to get uh, the president to pick up the call. It may not be enough to sway him to take another cause, but it's enough to get his attention for him to take your call. Mm -hmm. um, so the, there is a movement on that. You know, he... Um, with the margins being thin, uh, the votes of Arab Americans uh, can be crucial in whether or not um, the delegates go the Republicans or the Democrats' way in the next federal election. So he needs to uh, be seen as holding Israel's feet to the fire. Mm. Right. Now, um, I do not have words to describe what it is that I'm about to show you. It's bizarre. It is really, really, really bizarre. Um, we'll watch let, first, let, let's just seconds. start at the beginning. Yeah, we'll watch and, about 30 seconds and go from there. Yeah. It's, it's, it, one, it's of the, one of the descriptions I heard was, if you watch this with the sound off, it looks like an ad for teeth whitening. It really does. And here's the thing, kids, is I was trying to... It's about 17 minutes long, her response. Yeah, we're, we're and I was trying to isolate clips. And it's one like bizarre first, thing after another. Well, that's the thing, right? I got to like between the start and the first nine minutes, I kept on going, I will stop here. And then the next thing that came, mm -hmm. and I couldn't find a stopping point. No, and no. the reason why is because. It's how quickly things shift from one tone completely to another. It's how 
it's like if we were having an I was talking to Mr. Grizzly about, you know, oh, what's going on in Palestine is terrible. And he turns around and goes, I like keg. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like okay, totally let's let's uh, let's talk let's talk about cake. Oh my God, what's happening to these poor people in Nigeria? What the the, the emotional to, like? There's no. I let's just I get really to can't. Just normal watch. people don't speak like this. <laughs> let's just watch for a few minutes and then we'll 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 carry on. It's very bizarre. If you've not seen this, we'll just play a little bit. Good evening, America. My name is Katie Britt, and I have the honor of serving the people of the great state of Alabama and the United States Senate. However, that's not the job that matters most. I am a proud wife and mom of two school-aged kids. My daughter, Bennett, and my son, Ridgeway, are why I ran for the Senate. I'm worried about their future and the future of children in every corner of our nation. And that's why I invited you into our home tonight. Like so many families across America, my husband Wesley and I just watched President Biden's State of the Union address from our living room. And uh, what we saw was the performance of a permanent politician who has actually been in office for longer than I've been alive. One thing was quite clear, though. President Biden just doesn't get it. He's out of touch. Under his administration, families are worse off, our communities are less safe, and our country is less secure. I Isn't just all wish of that he understood what... Didn't, didn't everything she just say be a complete lie? Because he just yeah. said counter to that. So she's lying to your face after he just gave you the stats that showed things are down. Crime is down. We're safe for now. There's more jobs. So they're lying right to your face right after he told you the truth. Yeah. Real and, families are... Sorry. And um, the sun shiny at the beginning. Hi, mm -hmm. I'm Katie. Mm -hmm. And then the breathly mm -hmm. seductive thing. And then... Families are like you, you almost see it already. Like the kids are already said, like, I'm waiting for her to cry <laughs> already, like this. Um, yeah, oh, how dare she give her kids non gender coded names? <laughs> she secretly woke. Oh, I didn't even notice that. Um, let's keep going because, like I said, this is a sight to behold. Right? Yes, you should be laughing right now, but you should also be petrified because they're facing. Yes. People are the people to whom this is targeted are eating this shit up. As James Carvel said, they believe it in their bones. Around kitchen tables just like this one. You know, this is where our family has tough conversations. It's where we make hard decisions. It's where we share the good, the bad, and the ugly of our days. It's where we laugh together. And it's where we hold each other's hands and pray for God's guidance. Oh, and yeah, many nights, in to be honest, it's where Wesley and I worry. I know we're not alone. And so tonight, the American family needs to have a tough conversation. Because the truth is, we're all worried about the future of our nation. The country we know and love seems to be slipping away, and it feels like the next generation will have fewer opportunities and less freedoms than we did. I worry my own children may not even get a shot at living there. Wait a minute, less freedoms than we did? You guys took away a woman's right to make a health decision. <laughs> yeah. Irony is dead. <laughs> Kids are wondering, is that a green screen? I never thought of it, but it actually does I think look, it may be. I think it, it actually be. does look like. So I'm in my kitchen at home, but yeah, yeah I think don't, don't mind the fuzzy it. stuff around my shoulders. Yeah, I think it's. She's, oh, yeah. yeah. Keep going. Oh, boy. Your American dreams. My American dream allowed me, the daughter of two small business owners from rural enterprise Alabama, to be elected to the United States Senate at the age of 40. Growing up, sweeping the floor at my dad's hardware store and cleaning the bathroom at my mom's dance studio, I never could have imagined what my story would entail. 
to think about what the American dream can do across to just one generation in just one lifetime. It's truly breathtaking. But right now, the American dream has turned into a nightmare for so many families. The true unvarnished state of our union begins and ends with this. Our families are hurting. Our country can do better. And you don't have to look any further than the crisis at our southern border to see it. President Biden inherited the most secure border of all time. But minutes after taking office, he suspended all deportations, he halted construction of the border wall, and he announced a plan to give amnesty to millions. We know that President Biden didn't just create this border crisis, he invited it with 94 executive actions in his first 100 days. When I took office, I took a different approach. I traveled to the Del Rio sector of Texas. That's where I spoke to a woman who shared her story with me. She had been sex trafficked by the cartels starting at the age of 12. She told me not just that she was raped every day, but how many times a day she was raped. Okay, let's stop right there. The cartels put her on a map. Well, the whole thing is... Fake. I'm not going to show the rest of that uh, because it's just too much. But do you see... Okay, first of all, what she's talking about, look what could be achieved to the American dream. That's usually a comment that a person that is in a traditionally discriminated group would make. Now, women have been traditionally discriminated against, so I guess it applies. But usually it's something we hear somebody that has a little more pigmentation. Mm -hmm. Say, so, then they go, only in America can this happen. Doesn't happen only in America. It happens here all the time in Canada. It happens in France. It happens in Germany, right? Um, but then, talking about how her American dream comes up, she literally just shifts to scaring you about brown people at the border, and then talking to you as a normal person would. Mm -hmm. Let me just casually show, throw in a story about someone who was sex trafficked and basically she goes into very, very, very graphic detail. Well, the, very the, graphic detail. The woman never actually told her the story, by the way. No. Yeah. Well, but that's she never, she never met the woman. Uh, no. It's all garbage. It's all bullshit. The, the story is real. It happened in 2008 when, Oh, who was president at the time? 2004. 2004, that's right. Who was president at the time? Bush. Republican George W. Bush. Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. So, but she basically goes in to tell the story. About it also happened in Mexico. Who was child, yes, who was child, who was child fricked as a child, as a 12 year old. And, and she describes like about a mattress being in the room and people coming in. And the, I'm sure you can imagine the rest. She goes into extremely graphic detail, which is completely and totally unnecessary. So when you've watched the Saturday Night Live skit, now when you see Scarlett Johansson going, and now I'm going to suddenly, out of no reason at all, just switch into telling you a horrible graphic tale about mm -hmm. sexual abuse. Switches within five seconds. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> exactly completely inappropriate yeah that there's ways you can talk about these things without having to go into that much 
graph and mm-hmm. detail. And of course, she started the whole thing about concern for children, right? Uh, but as Mr. Grizzly says, some journalists did some uh, sleuthing on that, and it happened in 2004. It happened in Mexico. It, and um, it's not the first time she tells this story. She's been telling it for a while because the person to whom this happened has been public about what's happened to her and has testified before Congress to it. So she didn't actually meet this person. It's not like they had this one-on-one conversation. Like she went down to the border and met this person. Then this person confided this terrible story in her and she's bringing it back to us. Mm. Because that's what it's framed to look like. It's a story from a number of years ago. This person has said it for several times. Mm-hmm. Uh, I believe the last time they were in Congress, I think. I can't remember the date. But people have been like bringing in the C- C-SPAN clips of her actually testifying to that thing. And the... Um, it lies upon lies upon lies upon lies upon lies in that... 17 minute bizarre video because she just told you a story that, that I, I heard this. She told me herself, we'd be shocked if it happened in a third world country, but it didn't. It happened here in America. No, it happened in Mexico, not in America. It happened a long time ago. And this woman has told this story several times and you never met her. So you lied so many times in a five minute period. We're, we're not even five minutes into the video. She's already told a multitude of lies. Yeah. Um, if we can go to 533. Just a second. Um, no, the reason I, I, I'm isolating this particular clip, and it's the last clip I will show from her, show her, show of her, um, because it's, you should watch it for yourself. If you actually want to see a train wreck of a response, you should watch it for yourself. Um, but what's going on here from 533 for the next couple of minutes, very, 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 very much reminds me of the rhetoric of someone up here. Mm-hmm. Here we go. And I think you'll figure out who it is. Just think about Lake and Riley. In my neighboring state of Georgia, this beautiful 22 year old nursing student went out on a jog one morning, but she never got the opportunity to return home. She was brutally murdered by one of the millions of illegal border crossers President Biden chose to release into our homeland. Y'all, as a mom, I can't quit thinking about this. I mean, this could have been my daughter. This could have been yours. And tonight, President Biden finally said her name, but he refused to take responsibility for his own actions. Mr. President, enough is enough. Innocent Americans are dying and you only have yourself to blame. Fulfill your oath of office, reverse your policies, end this crisis and stop the suffering. Sadly, we know that President Biden's failures don't stop there. His reckless spending dug our economy into a hole and sent the cost of living through the roof. We have the worst inflation in 40 years and the highest credit card debt in our nation's history. Let that sink in. Hardworking. That's personal spending. What does that got to do with you? She literally just switched wow. from someone being murdered on a jog to inflation. Did you see that happen? Yeah, in real time. That in was real bizarre. time. Like this. The whole speech was like that, moving from one mood to another. And, you know, inflation, beware the people that are released, people on bail, people on this mm-hmm. is the reckless spending inflation is responsible for all of it it's literally pp's songbook yeah well and and here's the thing that you need to remember the united states economy is is built and based upon uh millions of undocumented workers 
who keep their economy rolling, who pick the crops, tend to the fields, who work in jobs that most people that look like me refuse to accept or take because you got to remember a lot of the places they work for, like in slaughterhouses, as an example, they pay them less than minimum wage because they can get away with it. So it increases their corporate donors' uh, monthly dividend check from whatever the name of the slaughterhouse company is. Probably, I'm actually not going to say the name because I think I know who it is. They've been, this same company has been nailed in Alabama with 14 year olds working in the slaughterhouse, a very dangerous place yep. for anybody to work, let alone a yep. 14 year old child. Yep. The economy yep. requires these people because the wealthy refuse to pay them a living wage. So the illegal workers, the migrant, illegal migrant workers keep their economy rolling. They do the yard work. They do the pool work. They pick the crops. They tend to the fields. They raise your children. But she doesn't mention any of that. The illegal migrants keep that economy running because the trickle-down economic theory that Ronald Reagan brought in in 1980 destroyed the economy, made some rich people richer, and made a whole lot more people poor, poorer and basically de decimated the middle class and crushed unions across the country. Mm -hmm. And that's why when uh, our, our old pal Jake, when we were on the show, asked us who we thought was the worst U.S. president in the United States history, my vote immediately was for yeah. Ronald Reagan. Yeah. Because um, of what Kit Hugh, the legacy I, that he left behind, people are still oh yeah Kit, reeling from forty four years yeah. later. Yeah, Kit Hugh, I have whiplash. Yeah. Kit Saucy, I fear your hands mail tail references. Right, women like her will help the Republican men gain power, thinking they'll share it just to be used and abused themselves. Uh, Kit Jen, tell a no, tell a novella level melodrama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially when she starts out saying like. Joe Biden's State of the Union was the performance of a, a lifetime or pulpo. <laughs> like, lady, it's like <laughs> somebody was saying yesterday, I think it was rep Representative Eric Swalwell going, and the Oscar goes, says, Kate, Kate, Katie Britt was robbed. She didn't get her Oscar for Best mm -hmm. Actress. And it's like, no, no, don't worry, Representative Swalwell. She did this in 2004. Shall it be eligible next yeah. year? <laughs> um, Kit PNC bio the facial expression never matches the emotion it makes it so creepy Kit Sassy you can see her face switch and settle to the next topic Kit Elaine we have the worst inflation smiles mm -hmm. the little smile just before she's about to stick it to her and that, that you see that all throughout um, yeah uh, I do not know what the hell that was. It's bizarre and that she delivered, but it was really, really. Well, from weird. the Guardian, Contents there's a, 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 um, an article from the Guardian that says Republicans baffled by Katie Britt's State of the Union response. One of our biggest disasters is a quotation from uh, a Trump advisor says, "What the hell am I watching right now?" It's one of her biggest disasters ever. <laughs> Yeah, they. Charlie and, Kirk, founder of the far-right Turning Point USA youth group, said, I'm sure Katie Britt is a sweet mom and a person, but this speech is not what we need. Joe Biden just declared war on the American right, and Katie Britt is talking like she's hosting a cooking show, whispering about how Democrats don't get it. Like, that was the worst thing the Republican Party could have ever had, was her and that speech. It was bizarre. And like some of the the breathiness and the you know like Scarlett Johansson goes and now out of the blue I'm gonna start talking seductively, <laughs> like breathy and it's like I have heard this at some point like this nine ninety nine for the first three minutes yeah, two ninety nine yeah. every minute after it was uh, breathy was not required no, no. here. It was very strange. And there was another person that posted a similar clip of her talking with Sarah McLaughlin's like the, in the mm -hmm, arms of the mm -hmm. angel behind it. President Biden, do your job. And the emotion that makes it look like at any moment that she's going to break out and cry and like this. And then all of a sudden she's tough and you see the eyes mm -hmm. go down. 
you know, it's like, it's like Johnny, you better not put that in your mouth. Eyes. <laughs> okay. Put that down. This is funny. <laughs> Michael, you, you nailed that one. <laughs> The breathiness. Sorry about what I'm about to say. Husband controlling the weave. Oh, 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 oh the mm-hmm. weave vibe. Ouch. Ouch. Let, let's, uh, let's wrap Ouch. up, sir. I got a meeting in a couple of minutes I got to get to. And I have a clip yes. for you here from a, a truck driver from Saskatchewan. Uh, and it's, he's talking, because, you know, we we covered a little bit earlier about he, uh, Pierre Polyev had an axe the tax rally in Toronto about axing the carbon tax. I think you're going to like this. Um Okay. Uh, let me put this on the screen. This is from TikTok. Um, at Tired and Frozen on TikTok. This is a truck driver from Saskatchewan. He's going to get you in the first half, but stay tuned. Watch the whole thing. It's a minute and 48 seconds, okay. and, and it's worth it. I fucking hate the carbon tax. I hate it. You see these coveralls, the Kenworth? Like these, we, we hate the carbon tax over here. And I hate it even more because if you want to read about it, you can't just search carbon tax. No, you know what you got to read? You have to read the Canadian Environmental Protection Act of 1999, the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act, the Output Based Pricing Systems Regulations, fucking ship stores regulations. And you know what you learn after reading a political science degree's worth of legislation? That even with the huge increase coming in, I only pay about an extra 14 cents a liter at the gas pump, which for me personally is gonna work out to around an extra $290 a year in expenses. But federally, I'm looking at them giving me an extra $1,500 back. I'm actually making money. But that's personal expense, that's not business. What about like the farmers? They're gonna pay through the nose trying to run all their equipment. No, they're exempt. And, and so are fisheries. So if you produce food, you don't pay carbon tax on fuel or heating. And with some amendments being made in 2024 to the Greenhouse Grass Pollution Pricing Act, farmers can get better rebates. Oh, but big businesses and industries, right? Like, why would they pay more money here when they can do it cheaper somewhere else? That's why we have the output-based pricing system. In a nutshell, those major industries pay more if they produce more greenhouse gases, they pay less if they produce less, and they can earn rebates if they invest in greener technologies. I've hated the carbon tax since day one, and the more I read about it, the more I hate it, because everything I hate, they thought about. I get money back. Farmers and fisheries are exempt. There's a scaling system for major industries. Like it, it just, it's so good. It just wrecks my whole worldview on, oh, fuck. <laughs> that was good, right? We've said it on the show many yeah. times. It was like, they managed to pass a carbon pricing regulatory fee that was not a tax mm-hmm. this, that had a rebate program that everything that the conservatives have done to try to upend it this, if all legislation was as well done and as well thought out and as well planned as this one yeah. was we'd be in a very very damn good place mm-hmm. This is this is legislation the way it was supposed to be done. They thought of all the ways that the conservatives could upend it. It's almost like when I used to prepare a debate, mm-hmm. I would prepare the for side, and then I would look at it from the pro, the con side, and I would try to destroy my own argument. And then if I could find some ways to destroy it, I would go back to the pro side and make it stronger put some stuff in it that would prevent those arguments from being made. And I would do it back and forth the other way. And it looks like the liberals did this like four or five, six times with this particular legislation because they knew that the other party would be gunning for it. But all the stuff is in there. All the stuff is in there. So like I said, you've got people. I actually did more math yesterday about carbon pricing. And remember when I said that they were getting upset on like 2.6 cents or 2.86 cents? That's what they were going on. That's 2.86 cents per cubic meter of -hmm. gas. Well, it dawned on me yesterday. I thought like... Cubic meter, that's a lot. What what is a cubic meter of gas? How many meters is that? 
That's 1,000 liters. Holy shit. <laughs> a thousand liters. Most people have a 50, yes. 40 to 60 liter tank. So think about that. Yes. So somebody said, posted this thing yesterday, which was like, it's a comic and it's a beaver looking at Trudeau dressed as a doctor holding a big copper tax pill, pill, what it looks like. And the beaver goes, you really expect me to swallow that? And he's got Trudeau going, of course not. It's a suppository, yeah. which caused someone to go, yeah, better put lots of lube on it. Like this, showing someone this. And I'm thinking there, wow, that makes it sound terrible. And then I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, you know, well, how terrible is this? I'm going... And somebody's going, how does everybody feeling about the new carbon tax increasing April 1st? And then when I did the math, it's like, um, I have absolutely no problem whatsoever with carbon regulatory fees, not a tax, the Supreme mm -hmm. Court said so, going up a full 2.86 pennies per cubic meter, that's 1,000 liters of gas, or 0 0.000286 cents a liter. So, yeah, not much. 0 0.00286 cents it's barely a liter. Negligible. You know how many liters you'd have to pump to pay one cent mm -hmm. more? At 0 0.002. Yeah. yeah, and that's on a thousand liters, right? Well, that, that's oh, per, per liter. liter. Sorry, so. That's 2.86 pennies thousand per 1,000 yeah. liters. So, like I said, if you, your tank is anywhere from 40 to 60 liters, how many Phillips is that? You know, and you're going to pay three cents on, <laughs> on you know, how many ga how many Phillips is that? So let's say you have a 50 so liter tank, so 20 fills, and it's going to cost you three cents more. I get it. It's more. I get it. Yes, it is additional expenditures. It's three freaking cents. Uh, and you're going to get for a thousand. And you're going to get how much back in your rebate? Right. Because the rebate's going yeah. up too. Yeah. So conservatives want you to be upset for three cents on a thousand liters. Meanwhile, how much money did Skippy spend in the last uh, quarter? A couple uh, million, two million dollars, something like what? that. Hopping around the country, campaigning yep. on our dime. Yep. Meanwhile, how much has your housing insurance gone up mm -hmm. this year? Because they won't address climate change. How much does it cost to have to rebuild? If you move home because of a fire Get or insurance flood? if you live in a certain part of the country now. Yeah, Mike, get Michael. But after I fill up, I'll stop at Starbucks for seven dollar coffee, or I'll go to a, or I'll go to a Pierre Poilievre rally and buy a forty dollar what yeah. the f. Well, the other the, the other one that always made me chuckle when somebody said it to me. I go, you know what? It, it's valid point. Valid point. Go and pull up to the gas station. And go dollar forty nine a liter. Holy shit, that's absurd! And then spend three dollars and fifty cents on half a liter of water in the convenience store at the gas station. I'm like, yeah, okay. But the thing is, I'm not buying fifty liters of water at a time. But sure, when you get right down to it, gasoline is one of the cheapest commodities you can buy. You just happen to buy a lot of it in one shot. And oh yeah, that's that's yeah. a good good point out too, Saucy. Seven thousand dollar water bill at Stornoway. The guy spent seven thousand dollars on water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Indeed. <sighs> Mr. Grizzly, do we have a shout? Sir. Yes. <laughs> that's the end of this episode of the daily beaver podcast or the daily beaver morning show we hope that you like listening to us because we loved making this for you now of course sharing is caring and you have the mouse from which we want the word to be shared so please tell your peeps and poops all about us and before i forget uh kit toronto dan great interview with uh, yeah, mike schreiner great. Yep, we enjoyed it. Uh, if you have some time, uh, please do uh, check it out. Uh, go to Toronto Dan's feed and uh, 
take a listen to it. Uh, hopefully, I'll be able to to find the clip and uh, put it, uh, not the clip, uh, the link and put it in mm-hmm. the chat for everyone um, before we uh, leave today. Um, if you do not want to miss an episode, you do not have to. Thanks to the Ray Girl who sponsored our pod page. That's podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver lowercase letters with the hyphen between each one of those words. If you subscribe there, when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, it will come directly into your inbox. And if you would like to support us in other ways, please, please, please like make make like Kit Elaine and go to our True North Eager Beaver YouTube site where you can click our buttons, like, share, subscribe, lick, tweak, click them all. We love it when you do it. It makes us feel real good. And right now, Chris Grizzly just put up a, a squiggly by his head right there that you can uh, do that. And uh, if you scan that, it'll bring it right to our YouTube Yeah, you might page. be watching this on Twitter or uh, Facebook or any one of a number of different platforms. This will take you directly to our YouTube page, and you can uh, join us there. And if you want, I can even, hang on a second here, I'll put it put it in the on the screen. If you want, you can uh, take a snapshot of that and go to YouTube at youtube.com backslash at True North Eager Beaver Media, and that'll take you right to our YouTube page where you'll be able to join the uh, Kits and Cubs in the chat. There you go. And if you'd like to support us in other ways, the squiggly that now appears brings us or brings you to the emergency hydration fund here at the Beaver Lodge. So, and which is through our coffee page, coffee, ko-fi.com slash eager beaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. And uh, that way, if you you have a couple of toonies or loonies floating around in your pocket and you would like to uh, donate them to this good cause to help us produce this episode and these episodes for you, we really, really would appreciate that. Thank you very much. Your generosity means the world to us. But of course, your gift of your attention is the one that's the most important to us. Because democracy is something that you do, write those letters. Uh, it seems that uh, Camp for Kindness is still going on in Hamilton in some way, shape, or form. They're being very resilient and creative and able to reorganize. So uh, please do support that initiative in any way that you can. I believe uh, the website is hamiltonhelps.org as well. So please go there to sign that petition to uh, ask our cities to have policies to open up armories to keep people who are homeless warm during the winter. But also, um, Camp for Kindness is all about, uh, you know, not evacuating people from spaces when they have no place else to go, I guess. And, you know, maybe giving them some places to go like converting old parking lots into places where we can build some mm-hmm. homes that provide some shelter to people. So please do make sure you do that. Uh, write your letters to your MLAs, your MPs, your senators, your media outlets to let them know what you think. It's very, very important. From the Beaver Lodge, this is your eager beaver saying it could be a tough world out there, so please be kind to and gentle with yourself. Mr. Grizzly, do you have some words of wisdom for us? Yeah, in these troubled times that we live in, try and remain calm and breathe. Speaking of breathing, because mine has returned correctly and happily and better, I will be hosting a, an ASMR show at uh, 9 p.m. this evening. For those of you who would like to uh, join in, you can find me at... Uh, actually, that doesn't does that take you to my channel? Yes, that takes you directly. If I can get that on the screen, you can scan that QR code and that will take you to um, my YouTube channel, my ASMR YouTube channel, where you can join me this evening at 9 p.m. for a mental health chat where I speak in a... Uh, low, soft, kind voice where I discuss mental health and how to deal. So that'll be at 9 p.m. this evening, Eastern Daylight Time. Because we are on Daylight Savings Time now, right? Eastern Savings Time or is it Eastern Daylight Time? It's not Standard Time anymore. I think I think just Daylight, daylight time, time, is it? EDT, not EST. I might no, be I wrong know. on that. No, it's not that important. I don't follow that. 9 p.m. <laughs> if you're in Eastern Canada. <laughs> All I need to know is what time If you're in the Eastern Time Zone... <laughs> <laughs> Eastern time zone, it's 9 p.m. All right. Kids and cubs, have a lovely day, Mr. Grizzly. Cue that rooster. Him right here. He's right here. I got him. You are listening to the Incorporated Podcast. The True North Eager Beaver Podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction 
fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and the Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. No particular Easter egg for me today, Mr. Wheelie, unless you have I one. did have something here. Where did it go? Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, this is from Tom Parkin. And let's see how we can blame Justin Trudeau on this because, you know, somebody somewhere will try and do that. But this is uh, Ford PC's hike home heating costs again, overruling the Ontario Energy Board and forcing customers to pay an extra $1 billion to Enbridge over the next four years. PC's to take more than $300 from the pocket of each Enbridge customer according to Merritt Stiles from the New Democratic Party of the province of Ontario. So, yeah, uh, once again, the conservatives, the fiscally responsible conservatives, like they like to tell you they are, are screwing you over to make rich people richer. That's it. That's there you all. go. They don't care. See you later. That's it. That's the strike. <laughs>